Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is a Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving you extra tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. Um, I have an awful lot of content to do in my updates that I'm on a backlog again. I was doing really well last week, cleared it all, and now I've got a massive load of stuff to talk about. There's just so much content out there. I'm going to start with a couple of bits of footage of, of war taking place, just to give you a sense of the reality and not the horrors as in like it, i'm not going to show you anything horrific but just the chaos and the noise and the danger that that is, that is war so this is a special forces team of the main director of the general staff of the russian mod in kremina forest a soldier is shooting a gm94 pump action grenade launcher now i uh, hopefully the noise isn't too loud you can see a pump action grenade launcher being used here and then just the amount of lead that is flying through the air and the sounds that go with that. Давай, 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 уходим. Шама, работать с пулемета. Уходим. So I thought that was that's good because there's you know there's no overt death and stuff involved in that and nothing inappropriate but it just gives you a real sense of place and of sound that soundscape and yeah incredible uh and then we're going to show you another one here which is bakhmut counter-strike uh, this is from Ilya ponomarenko uh sharing this one <laughs> Now, I'm no big gun. I'm not a big gun fan, right? Uh, let alone, you know, loads of guns all in one place getting shot all the time. But this is war. It's slightly different from having a gun and walking around my local neighborhood. Uh, but what little I know about firing ranges and whatnot is uh, <laughs> this guy is firing pretty close to his mate's legs. Uh, just you know, hashtag just saying. Прикрываемся с левой стороны, обходим. Ты первый, пошел. Дред, за ним! Ебаный, пидор. Гений. Ждем всех остальных! Uh, I don't want to show it anymore because you do see a couple of dead bodies and whatnot. But it just, again, it's that sound. It's the, the all of the lead that must be flying around the air, just and, and not knowing whether... I, I would, I'm amazed when I watch footage like this of people putting their heads up and, you know, looking around. And I just think, if my head's up and I can see over there and I can see a tree line, then that tree line can see me, which means my head is a prime target. Just, uh, I'm quite amazed the amount of uh, confidence people have. I suppose you get you get used to knowing where the gunfires come from, where the enemy likely are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, uh, you know, I I just think I would just be way more cautious. But then, you know, I, I've not experienced that that situation. But anyway, you can let me know what you think. Uh, so moving on from uh, in the war zone, there I'm going to we're going to come to a driver's control panel of a uh, captured T seventy two B three. Uh, just thought it would be of interest to show how cramped uh, these places are, but also what they can't see. Like the driver here, 
Like, no wonder sometimes you get tanks driving over people. He's looking through this tiny slit there. It doesn't seem to have any kind of um, video footage inside, as maybe more modern tanks might. That's it, incredible. I'd be interested if there's any uh, tank crew members out there that can give me an idea of, of, of driving in these things and, and the visuals. Right, we're going to go on to a big long thread, another Mick Ryan thread. This is, and I suppose this is linked, this is topical. I talked about in my frontline update today, a Ukrainian commander uh, that was taken out or some kind of uh, man associated, it's kind of humanitarian aspect to his role in in the in the armed forces there, but he was taken out in Chazif Yar, it appears, by Russian artillery. So in warfare, an important target is often the enemy commander and headquarters that assist them to plan and execute military operations. A thread on Grazimov, though. Uh, fa uh, a thread on Grazimov, failure and the coming Ukrainian offensives. Okay, killing a senior military leader can result in slower planning and decision-making. This can lead to a breakdown in the cohesion of the large military force, allowing friendly forces to attack them or exploit tactical opportunities while they can't respond effectively. The Chinese wall, uh, sorry, the Chinese call this systems distraction warfare. It is an extraordinarily effective approach if planned and coordinated well, particularly given the reliance on communications sensors and AI-based decision support tools by modern militaries. But for the coming offensive, the Ukrainians may avoid uh, targeting the one Russian commander in particular. This specific senior Russian officer has been ineffective since the beginning of the war. It's like, I, I, I like this. It's like, yeah, it's really useful to take out commanders, unless they're really crap commanders, in which case, uh, go for it, matey. You keep going, you keep making those terrible decisions, and we'll leave you alone. Maybe it's just, well, no, because he's, he's never going to be taken out by a Ukrainian drone, but he's more likely to fall out a window. Uh, this individual is General Grazimov. Okay, so the chief of general staff of the Russian armed forces and the commander of the Russian special military operation in Ukraine. So far in this war, Grazimov has been a four-time loser. His first failure was the original plan for the invasion of Ukraine based on assumptions that the Ukrainians could not put up an effective defense, uh, that the Ukrainian government would flee, and that the West would intervene. Uh, it planned on taking over Ukraine in 10 days or less. But Ukraine had other ideas. Russian forces appeared uncoordinated and chaotic in their inability to achieve their original strategy. As chief of the Ukrainian, uh, sorry, general staff of the Russian armed forces, Grazimov would have played a key role in the planning and approval of this plan. Grazimov's second failure was the shambolic initial weeks of the Russian mobilization that was announced by President Putin in September 2022. Over time, this effort became more streamlined, however, but Grazimov should have anticipated such a move once it was clear that the war was not going well. That is his job. It appeared that the military co commenced its mobilization efforts from a standing start after Putin's announcement. The old Soviet era army had extensive mobilization plans and processes for the rapid expansion of the ground forces. Grazimov, a project but of this era appears to have forgotten the need for the infrastructure, training cadres and reserve equipment for such mobilisation. This is largely due to a third failure. This third failure of Grazimov, which had a major influence on mobilisation failures as well as the Russian army's operational challenges, was a decade-long programme of transformation overseen by Grazimov and Shoigu. Commenced in 2012, I've talked about this previously in, in a video where um, I went into some depth about it, uh, commenced in 2012, the design and designed to professionalize the Russian military, modernize its equipment and bring it to a higher state of readiness. This program removed much of the old Soviet architecture for mobilization. This was no accident. It was a deliberate design choice by Gerasimov and Shoigu. And while this information, uh, this transformation was lauded by many in the West for its innovation, the reality is it removed the capacity for rapid expansion. I mean, it's one of those... I think one of those situations where you have a plan to modernize and you look around the world and you say, okay, they've organized their forces in this way that we're going to do that. 
but you do it so badly that you don't end up achieving the successes of that modernization. And then halfway through the the war, you realize it's gone so badly that you revert back to your original military doctrine. And so you get the worst of both worlds. You're then like in the wrong place to do the kind of Soviet era military doctrine because you, you've kind of spent all this time planning for this new type of military, but you didn't do very well and there was so much corruption it all went peak tong and then you kind of you just make a hash of both right um and as ukraine has shown the grasmov reforms have failed to build the kind of modern integrated and well-led military institution that is essential for success in contemporary war i mean the battalion tactical groups was a kind of example of that they've now kind of shied away from that that move uh, to round out this abysmal recent record general grasmov assumed command of the russian forces in ukraine and rapidly launched a wide-scale offensive in january this year a series of thrusts were conducted on five main axes of advance the russian military has experienced very limited success success with these offensives and even lost ground in the last in the past month according to US intelligence sources the russians have lost over 100,000 soldiers since december 2022 including 20,000 killed he rushed to failure given this record of poor performance one would think that Grasimov's days might be numbered, but the reality is Putin is likely to keep him in this position for the time being. Not only is Grasimov adept at palace politics in the Kremlin, but he is very loyal to Putin. As, uh, as ah, oh, in fact, when I was talking to you about it, was Dara Masakot that did that I was talking to you about the reforms. I said I did a bit of a deep dive into the reforms. It was uh, Dara Masakot who I was referring to when I did that. Noted when Gerasimov replaced Sorovikin in January this year, quote, they have taken someone who is competent and replaced him with someone who is incompetent, but who has been there a long time and who has shown that he is loyal. In authoritarian regimes, competent soldiers are less important than loyal ones, and as Gerasimov may find out in the future, they also make excellent scapegoats for tyrants wishing to save their own skin. What does Gerasimov's performance augur for the months ahead? The limp and ineffective offensives launched by Gerasimov this year have consumed large amounts of ammunition and equipment in addition to the number of soldiers killed and wounded. This will constrain Gerasimov's ability to effectively respond to the coming Ukrainian offensives, regardless of the number of obstacles that this that his forces construct to slow down the ukrainians the russians have a massive front line to defend it is a task that would challenge the very best of armies and the russians can hardly be described as that there is an old saying that quote when your enemy is making mistakes don't get in their way in this war so far Gerasimov has demonstrated a great talent strategic mistakes. Therefore, the Ukrainians may avoid targeting Grasimov because given his track record and the forthcoming Ukrainian offensive, Grasimov is very likely in the coming months to transition from a four-time to a five-time loser. Ouch. Who Burn. Uh, that's uh, retired General Mitt Ryan giving his uh, tuppence on the qualities or lack thereof of General Grasimov. And speaking of military successes, let's refer to Putin himself. In 2022, he said, I've decided to conduct a special military operation. This is 2023 at the Victory, Victory Day Parade. A real war is once again unleashed against our homeland. So he's moved from, I'm conducting a special military operation. This is me doing this. I am, me and my country are going to do the special military operation to, we've had unleashed upon us this war. Hmm, interesting, interesting move, transition there. Um, speaking of Putin, I love this, and I think I might do this in my own writing as well. Speaking of which... Uh, let's point you. I keep saying I'm going to point you towards an article I wrote the other day, but I haven't done that yet. Uh, so let's get that up. Anyway, I like this idea of calling Putin a dictator. I mean, we say that. I say that quite often. He he's like a dictator. He is. I kind of probably do say he, have said he is a dictator. Certainly an auto autocrat and all. It's an authoritarian regime. But actually, calling him a dictator in public 
you know mainstream media i think it would be really useful and and it's not trolling it, it's it's accurate so here we've got the Kiev independence says media putin signs annual decree on reservists training russian dictator vladimir putin signed a decree calling out military reservists for training in 2023 reuters reported on may the 10th citing a document published on a russian government website i love this Kiev independence saying just russian dictator not russian president no russian dictator Put him in in the same mix as all dictators we've seen. Tin pot dictators, horrific dictators. Putin's in there with them. He's one of them. Uh, so I'm going to call him a dictator, I think, in my future writing. Speaking of which, I wrote recently a, a, a article called The Many Dilemmas of the War in Ukraine. And it's just a, a little synopsis of some of the dilemmas in the war uh, and... Uh, in terms of sanctions, in terms of oil, in terms of fleeing Russians, what you should do with them, the Putin paradox, weapons, and on. And just saying that actually decisions in this war are difficult and quite often there, there are real moral dilemmas for, for all of the people making decisions, geopolitically speaking. Anyway, that's just a, a, a short article. Um, go and check it out. The many dilemmas of the war in Ukraine. I'll try and remember to link it in the description below. Right. Okay, moving on to another sizable thread here. This is Chris O'Wicky saying, Mobilised Russian soldiers from the Moscow region have described the extreme conditions they face around Avdiivka in eastern Ukraine, with men scavenging for food, drinking corpse-contaminated water and living and fighting amongst piles of rotting unburied bodies. The men's experiences have previously been highlighted in videos recorded by the men uh, themselves, in which they appeal to Putin to reassign them. And I've shown you a, a number of those videos. And by their relatives appealing in vain for Putin to return their men from slaughter. Uh, and there have been many of these relatives' uh, videos that have been posted. Many of the men died in repeated failed assaults against heavily fortified, fortified Ukrainian positions near Avdivka. However, some of the survivors got back to Russia and told their stories to their relatives, describing the World War I style conditions that they experienced. Uh, the Moscow region men were part of the first wave of mobilization. In September 2022, they were designated to serve as artillery men and were sent to uh, Serpukov military academy south of moscow where they studied gunnery for three months in december 2022 the men were sent to the donets people republic people's republic dnr where they spent two months waiting for their artillery pieces they were not even fed quote we did not even we did not eat or drink there was no food we had to buy everything ourselves the weapons never turned up the men were transferred to the DNR People's Militia on the 1st of March 2023 in their own words their army commanders quote sold them to the DNR the commander said it was only a month to give them some combat experience and that they wouldn't go to the front line. And this is something we've heard plenty of times, which is you have artillery men that are trained up to do artillery and then just being sent to the front line as your grunts, your your soldiers. Here's a Kalashnikov. Just run at that trench over there. Hang on, I'm trained. I've been trained to operate artillery here. Yeah, but yeah, we don't. We haven't got the artillery for you. Just here's a Kalashnikov again. You know. Keep on running. The three howitz of batteries were reorganized into 50 men companies and assault groups were formed from the mobilized men. So three howitz of batteries reorganized into 50 man companies and assault groups. Mm. Formed from the mobilized men, despite their lack of infantry training, they were mingled with the forcibly mobilized convicts from the DNR who were of very variable fighting quality. Quote, half of them are normal. Half are inadequate, says the wife of one of the Moscow Mobics concerning the DNR convicts. Quote, but my husband got some good ones. Sasha told them thanks for showing him how to fight. The commanders were not involved. So the training is by osmosis, right? By I'm shoved with a bunch of people. I've seen some of the ones over there are rubbish. But luckily for me, these guys know a thing or two about fighting and they're going to they're going to just so happened to tell me a few things and help train me. But it's not any kind of formalized training that's being delivered by the uh, the command. On the night of the 9th of the 10th of March, 9th 
to 10th of March, the men were given three days worth of food and water and sent to the front line near Avdiivka, where they were ordered to capture a Ukrainian-held piece of territory, but the operation turned into a bloody exercise in futility. Quote, it was impossible to capture anything there, says another wife. On our side were guys with submachine guns in small groups of 15 to 45 people, and on the other side there was artillery. What can one do with a submachine gun against a tank? This seems to be something that's quite common about Avdivka. There, There is an awful lot of video footage out there of Russians being sent out in the tea open in armoured personnel car carriers or on on foot sent against the, Ru the Ukrainians that have got very good, accurate, uh, effective artillery in the area. And they just hammer them out in the open. And then they go, okay, let's do that again. Uh, okay, how about now? And each time they're just hammered. And this is then borne out by the claims that you're hearing from back within Russia itself. The men made no progress in the attempted offensive and spent 12 days rather than the plan three on the front line. Quote, they sat in a trench and didn't even fire a single shot. There were only convicts and mobics in the trench. Who cares about them? In short, everything is shot at, at there. You put your hand out the trench and you're already without an arm. One guy from Dmitrov got his arm shot off like that when he stuck it out of the trench. Another one got hit by a tank. His head flew off. There was nothing left to collect. The soldiers say that they had no artillery or reconnaissance support. Quote, a lot of guys died. They were lost very stupidly. As my husband said, you can't beat a mortar shell with a helmet. Whew. Harsh. Um, they also had no food or water after the third day and had to scavenge both to stay alive. Had to sca scavenge both to stay alive. Quote, when they ran out of food, they had to climb into the cellars of abandoned houses, says a wife. They ate pickled cucumbers and tomatoes they found there. The men drank water from a well that where two corpses were floating, as there was nothing else to drink. They, quote, they defined it this way. If the water is salty, it means someone is swimming there. Requests to evacuate the seriously wounded were ignored, likely leading to many unnecessary deaths. Similar complaints were have been made uh, before about the DNR forces refusing to evacuate wounded Russians. Tensions with DNR commanders are also evident from the men's accounts. Quote, the DNR commanders say, we have conquered our own territory. Our men have all died. Now our men will sit and you will fight. It's your war. It's not our war. And I, uh, there was a video or uh, a Chris, o, another thread that went into details exactly about that. And that's what he's kind of referring to there that, that I shared with you before. Um, corpses piled up around the Russians. Quote, at night, you change your position. You run. You lie down to take cover, and there lies a corpse, black already. Uh, they are at every turn. The convicts clean them out. They take off their clothes, armour, uh, take things out of their pockets. It took months for the bodies of the fallen lying in the open to be recovered, according to one soldier. Men killed in November were only removed in March. They were wrapped in bags and taken away in cars, says one. Uh, our guys are fought literally surrounded by corpses. If possible, the dead were stacked in a forest belt and covered so that dogs and rats wouldn't eat them. One guy was killed by a drone. His body was taken to an abandoned school. It's probably still lying there. Uh, the soldiers' orders seem to have had no regard for the safety of civilians living near the front line. One soldier says their orders were that before entering a Ukrainian house, you had to throw a grenade and fire a shotgun round inside, but he claims they refused. Quote, our people didn't do that. Once we opened the door and there was a family with a child inside, they are, all, they are civilians. Well, we violated the order and took the people out at night because they are human beings. Despite their predicament, the men still made time for looting in the apparent hope of being able to take souvenirs home. Quote, they take televisions and household appliances from abandoned houses and put them in, in all in empty houses, says a wife. On March the 22nd, the Mobix abandoned their positions and retreated, leaving the DNR convicts in the trenches. Quote, the Donetsk convicts were, uh, were there and they said, go away. We understand why we are here. We can't go back. Our own people will shoot us. What are you here for? By this time, they had sustained about 35% casualties in only 12 days. The dead were buried in a trench and the seriously wounded were left behind. The retreating Mobix had to cross open ground under fire, but were provided with covering fire by the DNR convicts. The Mobix moved by running, quote, moved by running, occasionally rolling to the side uh, of the road into the bushes, then climbing up and running again, bouncing back, running again, before finally making it back to their headquarters. A wife says that 
quote, at the headquarters, they called them cowards. This is a level of insanity. After an interrogation, the platoon leaders were immediately taken to the military com commandant's office and arrested. The other men were taken away and detained. More artillery-trained Mobix were sent in to replace the men who had retreated. They took part in a fresh assault during the week after the 22nd of March, which was equally unsuccessful. Quote, the only survivors were those who came back from the first battle wounded and went to hospital. Each artillery battery had about 50 people in it. Of those in the battery they, that went into battle after the 22nd of March, the wife of one soldier says, quote, within three weeks, four men were left in the ranks. That's a casualty rate of 92%. Uh, the rest were all listed as missing rather than dead. And you'll see that that's a really common uh, method that the Russians use. They'll list troops as dead as missing so they don't have to officially count them as dead and their casualty rates aren't nearly as bad interesting that um this is on ukraine the latest podcast yesterday someone was talking about uh the experience of going and speaking with russian generals when they were trying to have peace talks uh, and whatnot back last year i think this was and it was really fascinating because they he was talking about how the ukrainians would present they say look Here's the amount of dead that you guys have lost in this area. Uh, here's all the evidence for this, uh, these dead troops. And the Russian generals wouldn't accept. They Apparently, they, they w w it was just fascinating that they would not, uh, they were afraid to even recognize that the Russians had, had lost X amount of troops. And so, so this kind of lack of uh, grasp of reality is at the very top uh, and you've got this set oh, i've talked about this before Vranya about the bs goes up and up the hierarchy of command well if the people at the top don't really have a proper grasp on on the casualty rates of the actual number of people who are dying on on the fronts then then they're going to be making seriously bad decisions garbage in garbage out uh, anyway i digress to finish off uh, chris o wiki says in April, the Ukrainians completely destroyed the Russian front line. Quote, the tanks flattened the houses to the ground. Some of the guys stayed there. Apparently, some are alive, some are not. One girl received a telephone call from her husband in the basement. Um, and actually, it continues. He said a friend was sitting nearby. He was shell-shocked and did not understand what was happening. He told her that they had no food or water. The men's relatives are lobbying for their return. We now have two tasks, to take out those who are alive and to take out the dead. Our men are followed by other mobilised people. They are sent there in exactly the same way, in exactly the same way they will lie down there. It's an endless meat grinder. However, their appeals to the Russian government have gone nowhere. All the paperwork is forwarded to the DNR and disappears into a bureaucratic void. Quote, everywhere uh, I was told that my husband was assigned to the second howitzer battery, says a wife. Officially, there was there is no paperwork and they were assigned to the DNR regiment. It's all based on some verbal orders. It is impossible to prove anything, but the guys keep being sent to assaults. It's unclear why they're being sent to certain death. Even seriously wounded men are being sent back to the fighting without being treated. In an assault on the 15th of April, five of the ten men from one company were wounded and two were killed. Only three were left uninjured. One of the uninjured was taken to hospital with shrapnel. One of the injured was taken to the hospital with shrapnel wounds. He has been unable to get an operation to remove the shrapnel from his body, his sister says. They told us, if it gets in the way, then you take it out. Their attitude is that they don't care whether he dies uh, with or without shrapnel. They send the shrapnel survivors back. After the publication of the men's videos caused a controversy, some of them were allowed to take leave on condition that they return to the front line. Despite their terrible experiences, at least some of them remain motivated and willing to keep fighting. That's incredible. Uh, one man's wife says that her husband, quote, is very responsible. He has a heightened sense of justice. He also said during his leave that he was going to back to die as he could not survive in such conditions. He will not allow any of his comrades to die while he is, sits on his ass. They are like brothers among themselves, even closer than family. She is now dis deeply disillusioned about the war. Why do we need this war? She asks. Is this our territory? We don't need it. No one needs it. 
our men wanted to help. They went like normal people. No one went into hiding. They went for their country thinking that the enemy is attacking us, that the enemy is at our borders, that we are defending our country, as our propaganda says, everywhere and everywhere. Really interesting that she has a grip on on the notion of propaganda and being fed certain narratives. Uh, so people give their lives for no one knows who, and the DNRites do not give them up at all. There is a part of the population there, the old school, who remember when it was a united country, and the young people are zombified and think that our people made this war. I conclude, says Chris O., uh, that all our government knows about this lawlessness and, and turns a blind eye, and the guys continue to die for nothing, for no one. Sorry, that's not Chris O. That is actually the quote from uh, the... Uh, one of the wives so just to, to repeat so people give their lives for no one knows who so this is what she is saying and the dnr rights do not give them up at all there is a part of the population there the old school who remember that it was a united country and the young people are zombified and think that the war that our people made this war in other words the russian people i conclude that all our government knows about this lawlessness uh, and turns a blind eye and the guys continue to die for nothing for no one wow so that's a really in, interesting insight into the mind of minds of some of these fighters and their family members who are the ones who are hearing this and i guess if they are the ones making the complaints then the soldiers themselves won't get reprimanded but you know it's far more difficult to uh reprimand a wife of of an injured soldier rather than you know do something to that injured soldier so yeah um Okay, uh, that pretty much brings me to the end of what I was going to say today. I am going to leave you with something a little bit different. We're going to go back to some wildlife. And, you know, I, I'm a big supporter of the Ukrainian hedgehog, hedgehog community. I've shown you some of their stuff before. And this is, I, I'm going to show this because actually Aman Soldin, who, a charming video of AFP journalists, and his team finding a hedgehog in a trench in eastern Ukraine. Uh, and yesterday, of course, he, he was killed or, or the day before. So I think it's only right to show him helping a hedgehog. Oh, yeah, my friend. Oh, he's so weak. I'm afraid he will die. Oh, he's going to wake up. He's going to wake up. Oh, check him out. See ya. Hedgehog survives. Yay. Uh, and something else as well, which is helping an owl that appears to have been caught. So UA soldiers come to the rescue of another wounded natural hunter. Uh, here we go. I wonder what he's caught up in some kind of uh netting or oh, that that wing's not going to be he's not going to i wonder what his long-term survival chances are you bite into the wobbly Good lad. This is quite some. Oh, wow. That's cool. Oh, that's quite the look. Petrified owl. Um, doing a good job. And is that it just flying somewhere low in the distance there? So it has 
they I mean I'd be amazed if that that wing maybe it can uh can allow it to fly and repair itself anyway that's uh, something a little bit different for the end of this video uh, appreciate all of your help and support with the channel thank you for watching please like subscribe and share uh do all those wonderful things that you do uh take care and I will speak to you soon